Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron. You're about to watch a teaching called Hell's Best Kept Secret. It's the first of three videos in the Way of the Master video series. This message is powerful and life-changing, so don't let anything distract you as you learn to arm yourself with what Charles Spurgeon called our ablest auxiliary. That means our most powerful weapon. In the late 70s, God very graciously opened an itinerant ministry to me. And as I began to travel, I found that I had access to church growth records and found in my horror that something like 80, even 90 percent of those making a decision for Christ were falling away from the faith. That is, modern evangelism with its methods was creating 80 to 90 of what we erroneously call backsliders with every hundred decisions for Christ. And this is normal, modern evangelistic results from local churches right up to large crusades. Let me make it more real for you. In 1991, a major denomination in the U.S. was able to obtain 294,000 decisions for Christ. That is, in one year, 294,000 decisions. And yet it could only find 14,000 in fellowship. That is, it couldn't account for 280,000 of the decisions. And this is normal, modern evangelistic results, as I said, from local churches right up to large crusades, and something I discovered way back in the late 70s. I began to make it a matter of urgent prayer and began to study the gospel proclamation of men like Spurgeon, Wesley, Moody, Whitfield, Luther, and others that God used down through the ages, and I found they used a principle which is almost entirely neglected by modern evangelism. I began teaching that principle and was eventually invited to base our ministry in Southern California specifically to bring the teaching to the church of the U.S. Now things were very quiet for the first three years until we received a call from Bill Gothard in Chicago. He'd been watching the teaching on video and he immediately flew me to San Jose in Northern California where I shared the teaching with a thousand pastors. Then he put the teaching on video and that year screened it to 30,000 pastors. The same year David Wilkerson called from New York. He'd been listening to the teaching in his car, called me on his car phone and immediately flew me 3,000 miles from LA to New York to share the one-hour teaching with this church. He considered it to be that important. And recently I heard of a pastor who had listened to the one-hour audio tape 250 times. I'd be happy if you'd listen just once to this teaching which is called Hell's Best Kept Secret. The Bible tells us in Psalm 19 verse 7 the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What is it that the Bible says is perfect and actually converts the soul? Why well, scripture makes it very clear. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now to illustrate the function of God's law, let's just look for a few moments at civil law. Imagine if I said, I've got some good news for you. This is great news. Someone just paid a $25,000 speeding fine on your behalf. You'd probably react by saying, what are you talking about? That's not good news. I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine. My good news wouldn't be good news to you. It would seem foolishness. But more than that, it would be offensive to you because I'm insinuating you've broken the law when you don't think you have. But if I was to put it this way, it may make more sense. On your way to work today, the law clocked you at going 55 miles an hour through an area set aside for a blind children's convention. There were 10 clear warning signs stating that 15 miles an hour was the maximum speed, but you went straight through at 55 miles an hour. What you did was extremely dangerous. There's a $25,000 fine. The law was about to take its course when someone you don't even know stepped in and paid the fine for you. You are very fortunate. Can you see that telling you precisely what you've done wrong first actually makes the good news make sense? If I don't bring clear instruction, you've violated the law, then the good news will seem foolishness, it will seem offensive. But once you understand you've broken that law, then that good news becomes good news indeed. Now in the same way, if I approach an impenitent sinner, someone whose understanding is darkened and say, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, 
It'll be foolishness to him and offensive to him. Foolishness because it won't make sense. The Bible says that. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And offensive because I'm insinuating he's a sinner when he doesn't think he is. As far as he's concerned, there are plenty of people far worse than him. But if I take the time to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, that may make more sense. If I open up the divine law, the Ten Commandments, and show him precisely what he's done wrong, that he has offended God by transgressing his law, then when he becomes, as James says, convinced of the law as a transgressor, then the good news of the fine being paid for him will not be foolishness, it will not be offensive, it will be the power of God unto salvation. sin, you commit adultery, you feel guilty. You'll say, God, I'm sorry. That doesn't mean you're forgiven. Think of it like this. If you stand in front of a judge, there's a $50,000 fine against you. And a judge is anything to say, you say, Judge, I won't commit the crime again. I won't do it again. And I'm really sorry. He won't let you go just because you're sorry, just because you won't do it again. Of course you should be sorry. You've broken the law. And of course you shouldn't do it again. He will not let you go on the basis of being sorry or not doing it again. But if someone pays your fine, then the judge can let you go. Just justice has been done. And God will not forgive you just because you're sorry. Of course you should be sorry if you commit adultery. If you watch filthy movies, your conscience will condemn you. If you lie or steal or lust, you know in your heart you're doing wrong. And of course you shouldn't do it again. And God will not forgive you just on the basis that you're repentant or that you're contrite. But if someone paid your fine, then God will forgive you on the basis that someone paid your fine. Well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ paid the fine for the sins of the world. The Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus Christ took the punishment. John the Baptist said of Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, a substitutionary death. He paid our fine and he rose from the dead, a defeat of death. And if you'll repent and trust in him, God will forgive your sins and grant you everlasting life on the basis that Jesus Christ took your punishment, on the basis that he paid your fine. Let's now look to the scriptures for some of the functions of God's law for humanity. Romans 3 verse 19 says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So one of the functions of God's law is to stop the sinner's mouth and leave the whole world guilty before God. It's to stop a sinner justifying himself and saying, there's plenty of people worse than me, I'm not a bad person really. The law is not just for the Jews, but the whole world. Next verse says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. God's law tells us what sin is. 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of the law. Then in Romans 7, verse 7, Paul says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. And then he said an amazing statement, No, I had not known sin but by the law. Paul said, I had no idea what sin was until the law told me. And Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Are you being stealing? Are you a thief? Are you a thief? Well, not in your life, no. no. What sort of, are you a white collar criminal? You put on a white collar and steal from people. Yeah, I wouldn't be here now. Probably. So you are a thief. Everyone has, I, yes. I'm not talking to everyone, I'm talking about you. Yeah. What are you? Who am I? What are you? A thief. Are you the caterpillar? You're a thief. Now, have you ever told a lie? No. Have I told? Yes. Once. Once, so you're a liar and a thief. <laughs> a lying thief! No wonder you feel guilty when you look at these guys like federal agents. You see, your conscience accuses you. Conscience means with knowledge. Every time you've lied or stolen, you've known in your heart you've done wrong. Conscience! And God's going to judge you, friend, on the day of judgment you stand before God. You say, I don't believe that. Don't stand on a freeway and don't believe in trucks. You'll get crushed. You're on a path of sin, the vehicle of eternal justice is hidden for you, and unless you repent, you're going to perish. You need to repent and put your no. faith in Jesus Christ. 
I'm not sure I need to repent. You're not sure? No. Let me help it's you. unclear. I am sure. Stop with this. Jesus Stop said, with unless this. you repent, you will perish. What are you going to do on the day of judgment? God is not willing that you should perish. He wants you to come to repentance. Now, do you know why Jesus died on the cross? He died on the cross. Yeah, do you know why? Because no one took him down. Now, do you know why? Seriously. For my sins. Yeah, that's right. He took the punishment for I your need to die for my sins. For your life. He took the punishment so God doesn't have to judge you as a lying thief. You see, have you ever lusted after a woman? Maybe once. Just once? Man, you surely are Maybe. a liar. <laughs> so now, by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving adulterer at heart. Man, you are going to end up in hell. That's because, well, You've got to repent. I don't want you to end up in hell. You've got to repent for your faith in Jesus. What's that? He sounds like an imperfect human to me. He is. He's an imperfect human. That's what the Bible says. We're all imperfect. We have come short of the glory of God. That Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're not, so we need to be We need to be made perfect. How do we do that? Through trusting in Jesus Christ. He will make you perfect. He'll make you holy. He'll make you just. And he'll make you good. You say, man, how could that be? Grace. Well, God's law is like a mirror. When we look into the perfect law of liberty, we should see we're all as an unclean thing and all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And once we see ourselves in truth, we go from the mirror of the law to the water of the blood of Christ to wash. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. God's law doesn't help us, it just leaves us helpless. It doesn't justify us, it just leaves us guilty before the judgment bar of a holy God. And the tragedy of modern evangelism is that around the turn of the last century, when it forsook the law in its capacity to drive sinners to Christ, modern evangelism therefore had to find another reason for sinners to respond to the gospel. And the issue that modern evangelism chose was the issue of life enhancement. The gospel degenerated into Jesus Christ will give you peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. To illustrate the unscriptural nature of this very popular teaching, I'd like you to listen very carefully to this following anecdote because the essence of what I'm saying pivots on this particular point. Two men are seated in a plane. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on as it would improve his flight. He's a little skeptical at first as he can't see how wearing a parachute in a plane could possibly improve the flight. After a time, he decides to experiment and see if the claim is true. As he puts it on, he notices the weight of it upon his shoulders, and he finds that he has difficulty in sitting upright. However, he consoles himself with the fact he was told the parachute would improve the flight, so he decides to give the thing a little time. As he waits, he notices that some of the other passengers are laughing at him because he's wearing a parachute in a plane. He begins to feel somewhat humiliated. As they begin to point and laugh at him, he can stand it no longer. He slinks in the seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it to the floor. Hey, that's, yeah, that's what you should do. <laughs> as far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before anyone gets one of those things on his back again. The second man is given a parachute, but listen to what he's told. He's told to put it on because at any moment he'd be jumping 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts the parachute on. He doesn't notice the weight upon his shoulders, nor that he can't sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without that parachute. The first man's motive for putting the parachute on was solely to improve his flight. The result of his experience was that he was humiliated by the other passengers. He was disillusioned. As far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before anyone gets one of those things on his back again. The second man put the parachute on solely to escape the jump to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him without it, he has a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart knowing that he's saved from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery of the other passengers. His attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. Now listen to what the modern gospel says. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ who will give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. So the sinner responds and in an experimental fashion puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? The promise, temptation, tribulation, and persecution. The other passengers mock him. So what does he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offended for the word's sake. 
is disillusioned and somewhat embittered, and quite rightly so. He was promised peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness, and all he got were trials and humiliation. His latter end becomes worse than the first, another inoculated and bitter backslider. Instead of preaching that Jesus improves the flight, we should be warning sinners they're going to have to jump out of the plane. The disappointed a man wants to die, and after this the judgment. And when a sinner understands the horrific consequences of breaking God's law, then he will flee to the Savior solely to escape the wrath that's to come. And if we are true and faithful witnesses, that's what we'll be preaching, that there is wrath to come, that God commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. You see, the issue isn't one of happiness, but one of righteousness. It doesn't matter how happy a sinner is, how much he's enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, without the righteousness of Christ, he'll perish on the day of wrath. The Bible says, riches profit not on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Peace and joy are legitimate fruits of salvation, but it's not legitimate to use these fruits as a draw card for salvation. If we continue to do so, sinners will respond with an impure motive, lacking repentance. Now, can you remember why the second passenger had joy and peace in his heart? It was because he knew the parachute was going to save him from sure death. And as a believer, I have, as the Apostle Paul says, joy and peace in believing because I know that the righteousness of Christ is going to deliver me from the wrath that's to come. Let's now take a close look at an incident on board the plane. We have a brand new stewardess. It's her first day. She's carrying a tray of boiling hot coffee. She wants to leave an impression on the passengers, and she certainly does. Because as she's walking down the aisle, she trips over someone's foot and slops that boiling hot coffee all over the lap of our second passenger. Now, what's his reaction as that boiling liquid hits his tender flesh? Does he go, man, that hurt? Mm-hmm. He feels the pain. But then does he rip the parachute from his shoulders, throw it to the floor and say, the stupid parachute? No, why should he? He didn't put the parachute on for a better flight. He put it on to save him from the jump to come. If anything, the hot coffee incident causes him to cling tighter to the parachute and even look forward to the jump. Now, if you and I put on the Lord Jesus Christ, when tribulation strikes, if we put him on for the right motive, we won't get angry at God, we won't lose our joy or peace. Why should we? We didn't come to Jesus for a happy lifestyle. We came to flee from the wrath that's to come. And if anything, tribulation drives a true believer close to the Savior. And sadly, we have literally multitudes of professing Christians who lose their joy and peace when the flight gets bumpy. Why? They're the product of a man-centered gospel. They came lacking repentance without which you cannot be saved. I was in Australia some time ago. Australia is a small island off the coast of New Zealand. And I preached sin, law, righteousness, holiness, judgment, repentance, and hell. And I wasn't exactly crushed by the amount of people who want to give their hearts to Jesus. In fact, the air went very tense. After the meeting, they said, there's a young guy down the back who wants to give his life to Christ. I went down the back and found a teenage lad who could not pray the sinner's prayer because he was weeping so profusely. Now, for me, it was really refreshing because for many years, I suffered from the disease of evangelical frustration. I so wanted sinners to respond to the gospel, I unwittingly preached a man-centered message, the essence of which was this. You'll never find true peace without Jesus Christ. You have a God-shaped vacuum in your heart only God can fill. I preach Christ crucified. I preach repentance. A sinner would respond to the altar and open an eye and say, oh no, this guy wants to give his life to Jesus and there's an 80% chance he's going to backslide. And I am tired of creating backsliders. So I'd say to myself, I better make sure this guy really means it. He better be sincere. So I'd approach the poor guy in a Gestapo spirit. I'd walk up and say, and what do you want? He'd say, I'm here to become a Christian. I'd say, do you mean it? He'd say, yeah. I said, do you really mean it? He'd say, yeah. I'd say, okay, I'll pray with you, but you better mean it from your heart. He says, okay, okay. I say, you repeat this prayer sincerely after me and mean it from your heart sincerely and make sure you really mean it from your heart sincerely, from your heart. And I'd bow in prayer. I'd say, oh God, I'm a sinner. And I'd watch him. And he'd say, oh God, I'm a sinner. And I'd say, man, why isn't there a visible sign of contrition? There's no outward evidence the guy is inwardly sorry for his sins. If I could have seen his motive, I would have seen he was one hundred percent sincere. He really did mean his decision with all his heart. He really sincerely 
wanted to give this Jesus thing a go to see if he could get a buzz out of it. He wasn't fleeing from the wrath that was to come because I hadn't told him there was wrath to come. There was a glaring omission from my message. He wasn't broken in contrition because the poor guy didn't know what sin was. And remember Paul said in Romans 7 verse 7, I had not known sin but by the law. How can a man repent if he doesn't know what sin is? Any so-called repentance would be merely what I call horizontal repentance. He's coming because he's lied to men, he's stolen from men. But when David sinned with Bathsheba and broke all ten of the ten commandments, when he coveted his neighbor's wife, lived a lie, stole his neighbor's wife, committed adultery, committed murder, dishonored his parents, and thus dishonored God, he didn't say, I've sinned against man. He said, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. When Joseph was tempted sexually, he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? The prodigal son said, I have sinned against heaven. Paul preached repentance towards God, and the Bible says godly sorrow works repentance. And when a man doesn't understand that his sin is primarily vertical, you'll not exercise biblical repentance. It'll be superficial, experimental, and horizontal. And when tribulation, temptation, persecution comes, he'll fall away for the word's sake. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8 says, But we know that the law is good if anyone uses it lawfully for the purpose for which it was designed. The Bible says God's law is good if it's used lawfully. We have a bread knife at home. That bread knife is a good knife. It's big, it's sharp, it slices bread really well. It's good if it's used correctly. But if I use it to plunge into my neighbor's back, it's not a good knife. The problem, though, isn't with the knife. It's with the hand holding the knife. And God's law is good if it's used lawfully for the purpose for which it was designed. Well, what was it designed for? The following verse tells us. The law was not made for a righteous man, but for sinners. It even lists the sinners. Homosexuals. Fornicators. If you want to bring a homosexual to Christ, don't get into a bait, debate with him over his lifestyle. Give him the Ten Commandments. The Bible says the law was made for homosexuals. Show him that he is damned despite his lifestyle. You know what the word conscience means? Yeah. It means with knowledge. Right. So what you've done is that you've removed the batteries from the smoke detector so it won't cause an alarm. That's basically what you've done. Your conscience is like a smoke detector. Your smoke mm -hmm. detector warns you when there's a fire so you can get out. Your conscience is like that. By destroying the power of your conscience, mm -hmm. you've removed the batteries from that alarm that God has given you to tell you it's wrong. You right. know what the Bible says? Homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. Now, you know how to tell if you're a sinner? Any idea? I, I, well, based on the Bible verse, I think that we all sin and fall short of God's glory. You know what the glory is? What's the standard that he's speaking of? A, a, a Christian standard. A, yeah, well, you know what it is? The, the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Now, right. let's go through them. Right. Okay. I'll keep an eye on your stand and I'll tell Thank you. you. Robbing I'm going to get in so much trouble. No, okay, you're not. You're doing fine. Thank you. Go ahead. Your name's Travis? Oh, I'm insulted. Do I look like a Travis to you? No, yeah, you're probably. It's Blake. Blake. That's Blake. Funny. Okay. Right. Why did I think of Travis? I have no idea. <laughs> but go ahead. Okay, Blake. Let's take you through the commandments. Have you ever told okay. a lie? Yes. So what does that make you? A sinner. No, more specifically, what does it make you? A liar. So, have you ever stolen something? No. I don't believe you because you just told me you're a liar. Oh, very good. Good one. So have you ever stolen something even if it's small, no, irrespective no. of the value? Ballpoint pen, paper clip, no. come on, be honest. My, my parents always gave me a, a, a nice allowance. I didn't have to steal anything. You didn't, not, never stolen anything in never, your whole life? Ne never had to steal okay, anything. Okay, I'll let you have that. Thank you. Now, Jesus said if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked with lust? Uh, out here, of course. Okay. Yeah. We won't go into that further. Okay. Here's a fourth question. <laughs> have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. I heard you use it before. Instead of using a four-letter filth word beginning with S to express disgust, mm. you've taken the name of the God who gave you life and brought his holy name down to the level of that word to express disgust, which is called blasphemy. Did right. you know that? Yes. And the Bible says the law will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So bearing in mind you've, you've committed adultery in your heart, Jesus said, if you look with lust, you're a liar by your own admission, you're a blasphemer. Mm. If you stand before God on judgment day and he judges you by the Ten Commandments, do you think you'll be innocent or guilty? I, I, I thank you very much. I think that I would be guilty, but thank God we have such a merciful God, and there's always an opportunity to seek forgiveness. And I know that God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And Where I, did you hear that? That's not biblical. That's something that we say so we don't offend homosexuals, but the Bible doesn't <laughs> say that. 
Do you know that? Do you know what the Bible says? Tell me. God's wrath abides on you. Mm -hmm. That every time you sin, you're storing up wrath that will be revealed on the day of wrath. The Bible calls you and I, if we're not Christians, by nature, children of wrath. Mm. And if you died, the Bible makes it very clear you wouldn't go to heaven, you'd go to hell. If you want to bring a Jew to Christ, lay the weight of the law upon him. Let it prepare his heart for grace as happened to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. Remember when Peter stood up to preach on the day of Pentecost, to whom was he speaking? Devout Jews from every nation under heaven. Men who therefore ate, drank, and slept God's law. So when he stood up to preach, he didn't preach wrath, judgment, law, holiness, righteousness. He merely told them the good news of the fine being paid for them. And the Bible says, they were pricked in their heart and cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? The law was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. If you want to bring a, a Muslim to Christ, lay the weight of the law upon him. Let it prepare his heart for grace. Muslims accept Moses as a prophet. They accept Jesus as a prophet. We'll give them the law of Moses. Give them the spiritual nature of the law with the words of Jesus. Strip them of their self-righteousness. Show them they desperately need God's forgiveness. I heard of a Muslim reading a book, Hell's Best Kept Secret, and God soundly saved him purely through the reading the book. Why? Because the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Think of the woman caught in the act of adultery. They were going to stone her to death. She had violated the seventh commandment. She found herself between a rock and a hard place. Her only avenue of escape was to fling herself at the feet of the Son of God. And that is the function of God's law, to condemn. You say, but you can't condemn sinners. Saints, they're already condemned. He that believes not is condemned already. John 3, verse 18. All the law does is reveal to himself in its true light. It's like this, ladies. You have a wooden table in your living room. You dust it down. It's dust-free. It's clean. Then you draw back the curtains and let in the early morning sunlight. What do you see on the table? Dust. What do you see in the air? Dust. Did the light create the dust? No, the light merely exposed the dust. And when you and I take the time to draw back the curtains of the Holy of Holies and let the light of God's law shine upon us in his heart, all that happens is that he sees himself in truth. But that's a totally different kind of statement. Your statement is, I know that this is what happens. I'm saying, I know that nobody could possibly know what happens. Okay, that means you've got all knowledge. You are God. You know every human being on the face Actually, of the I earth and what they think. <laughs> you know what everybody thinks, and you know that there's no one on this earth who knows that the Bible is true. That is so arrogant. Okay. Can you see that? Maybe they believe it, but one day they will either know for sure or not. Right now on this earth, they could not possibly know. Okay, let me tell you how I know. Would you like to know how I know? Yes, I would. This, this is so simple, it will probably offend you. A little kid was looking at a heater. His dad comes in and says, son, that heater's hot, don't touch it. The kid says, okay, that's hot. Dad goes out of the room. The kid says, I wonder if it really is hot. So he reaches out his little hands and grabs the heater bar. The second his flesh burns, he stops believing the heat is hot. He now knows it's hot. He's moved out of the realm of belief into the realm of experience. Okay? A heat expert comes in and says, Kid, I know the heat is not hot. I'll prove it to you. The kid's not interested because he's experienced the power of its heat. Now, for 22 years as a non-Christian, I believed in God. I prayed at night. I believed Jesus was the Son of God, but I was not converted. 25th of April, 1972, 1.30 in the morning, I reached out and touched the heater bar of God's love and forgiveness and moved out of the realm of belief into the realm of experience. So I know and believe and am persuaded, as the Bible says. The Bible says you'll know that you pass from death to life. And today you can know your sins are washed away. You can know on Judgment Day when you stand before God you won't be condemned that God's granted you everlasting life if you'll obey the gospel. But you are so self-righteous. You won't even admit your sins. You'll never ask God for forgiveness because you don't feel guilt. And I do hope that changes, Rose. The commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. That's why Paul said in Romans 7, verse 13, by the commandment, sin became exceedingly sinful. In other words, it was the law that showed Paul's sin in its true light. It may be beneficial if I share with you how I witness on a one-to-one -one basis. I'm a very firm believer in biblical evangelism. I would never approach an impenitent sinner and say, Jesus loves you. Why? Because there's no biblical precedent for it whatsoever. I wouldn't even say to a complete stranger I wanted a witness to, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus Christ. You see, if you're in a deep sleep and I wanted to awaken you, I wouldn't use a flashlight in your eyes. I'd use a light dimmer. I'd be very gentle. And the Bible says the servant of the Lord must be gentle unto all men, first the natural, then the spiritual. Why? 
because the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They're foolishness to him because they're spiritually understood. So when I want to witness to someone, I believe we should follow the precedent of John chapter 4. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, he began in the natural. Water. Swung to the spiritual. Brought conviction using the law of God, specifically the seventh of the Ten Commandments. Then he revealed himself to her. So when I meet an impenitent sinner, this is how I make my approach. I start with something like, how are you doing? And he might say something like, I'm pretty good, how are you? I tell him I'm pretty and good. And I say to myself, here is a congenial sinner. Here is someone who was friendly enough to say, how are you doing? He's asked about the well-being of a complete stranger. So I feel at liberty to strike up a conversation with him. And often I talk with him about the natural. Maybe I'll get out a, a gospel tract, one of our titanic tracts, which always goes down well. It's a good icebreaker. And I give it to him. And then I reach into my pocket and I get out a penny with the Ten Commandments on it. Now we have a machine that presses out these Ten Commandments. It's legal to do this in the US. The machine was very expensive, but I guess it's been worth every penny. So I give him the penny. He says, what is it? I say, it's a penny with the Ten Commandments on it. Now all I'm doing is putting out a feeler to see if he's open to spiritual things. And most people say, oh, Ten Commandments on a penny, huh? So I feel at liberty to say, do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? And most people say, oh yeah, pretty much, I haven't killed anyone yet. I say, well, let's go through them. He says, okay. I said, have you ever told a lie? He says, yeah, one or two. I said, what does that make you? He says, a sinner. I said, no, more specifically, what does it make you? He said, well, man, I'm not a liar. I said, well, how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? Ten and a bell rings? Isn't it true you tell one lie, that makes you a liar? He says, yeah, I guess you're right. I said, what are you? He says, I'm a liar. So have you ever stolen something? He says, no, no, no. I said, come on, you've just admitted to me you're a liar. Now, have you ever stolen something, even if it's small? He says, oh, yeah. I said, what does that make you? He says, a thief. I said, have you ever used God's name and blasphemy? He says, I haven't done that for years. I said, what, you blasphemer? Time doesn't forgive sin. I said, now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever done that? He says, yeah, plenty of times. I said, by your own admission, then you're a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart, and you've got to face God on Judgment Day. And we've only looked at three of the Ten Commandments. And when we look at those other commandments, they surely leave us guilty. Number one, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. That means God commands, our Creator commands, that He be the focal point of our affections. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. To a point where our love for mom and dad, brother and sister, and our own life seems like hatred compared to the love we have for the God who gave those loved ones to us. And the Bible says there's none that seek after God. No one can say I've kept the first of the Ten Commandments. The second is, you should not make yourself a graven image. That is, you should not make a God to suit yourself. Where ones would say, my God isn't a God of wrath and judgment. My God's a God of love and mercy. He would never create hell. Well, if someone says that to you, agree with them. Say, you're right. Your God would never create hell because he couldn't. He doesn't exist. He's a figment of your imagination, the place of imagery. You've shaped a God to suit yourself. You've said, I'm the part of your the clay, and you've made a God to suit your sins. It's called idolatry. And it's the oldest sin in the book, and the Bible says idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of God. We've looked at the third. The fourth is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I went for 22 years as a non-Christian, knowing that God gave me life, and never once saying, God, what do you require of me? One day in seven, I blew that commandment. The fifth, honor your father and mother. Blew that in my teenage years, just an attitude. And the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. The sixth, you shall not kill. You'd think we'd be safe from that commandment, but Jesus said, whoever gets angry without cause is in danger of judgment. And the Bible says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. We've looked at the seventh, eighth, ninth, and the tenth is, you shall not covet. And who of us can say, I've never desired something that belongs to somebody else? And the final nail in our coffin is, whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, the same is guilty of all. You don't have to break ten laws to have the police after you, just break one and you're in debt to justice and the law will chase you. So I now say to my friend who looks at the commandments, I says, if God judges you by that standard on judgment day, 
do you think you'll be innocent or guilty? He says, man, I'll be guilty. So do you think you'll go to heaven or hell? And most people say, I think I'll go to heaven. Have you ever told a lie? Yes, I have. What does that make you? It makes me a liar. Have Big you ever deal. stolen something? <laughs> of course, I'm a kleptomaniac. So what does that make you? <laughs> a thief. Okay, now Jesus said if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever done that? I'm pretty sure. You're pretty sure? I'm not, I can't guarantee it. You've I'm... never looked, you're not sure if you looked at a woman with lust? Yeah, I have. I'm sure so, I have. Okay, so. Yeah. Your turn's in a minute. Yeah, you have. Have you ever used God's name in vain? <laughs> yeah, of course. So you've used God's name as a curse. Yeah, word. I gave him the finger and cussed him. Okay, I cuss him so all the by time. your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer heart, a blasphemer, and you've got hatred in your heart, what the Bible says is murder. Now, if God judges you by that standard on the day of judgment, the Ten Commandments, do you think you'll be innocent or guilty? I think I'm going to be guilty, but if you Hey, no buts. Would you go to heaven or hell? I think I'll still go to heaven. Why? Because if he's such loving and forgiving God as as like the Bible speaks, as like people have told me, I don't think he's going to send me to hell for stupid Do shit. you know what? You've got to watch your language because there's ladies stupid around. Stuff. So just Sorry. apologize to the ladies. Lift the microphone up a little and speak out clearly. Do you know what you've just done now? You've broken the second of the Ten Commandments. You've created a God to suit yourself. You've made a God in your own image. Yeah, I believe in Diana. My You've goddess. made up your own God. I didn't make up See, my own God. See, your God doesn't care about liars or thieves, adulterers, fornicators. Hold, hold up. Paganism's been around a lot longer than Christianity, so we didn't make up nothing. You guys are the ones who made up God. Christ Christianity So was... if you die in your sins, you're going to be guilty, and the Bible says you'll end up in hell. I don't want that to happen to you. Your Bible says I'm going to hell. Absolutely. That's what I'm telling you. And God's word is true. You can rely on it. I say, why is that? You believe God is good and he'll overlook your sins? He says, yes, that's it. I say, well, try that in a court of law. You've committed rape and murder. You say, judge, I know I'm guilty. I know you're going to pass sentence, but I'd like to say something. I think you're a good man, and therefore you'll just let me go. The judge would probably say, you're right about one thing. I am a good man, and because of my goodness, I'm going to see that you're punished. And the very thing that sinners are hoping will save them on the day of judgment, the goodness of God, will be the very thing that will condemn them. Because if God is good, he must by nature punish murderers, rapists, thieves, liars, fornicators, blasphemers, and those who have lived contrary to the inner light, the conscience that God has given to every man. You say you're a good person, you said you're a nice person. That's correct. Now I'm going to judge by God's standard whether that's true, okay? Okay. Have you ever told a lie? Of course. Have you? What does that make you? Yes, yeah, I've told a lie. Yeah, I've broken the commandments. Let me just take this down so you can see what I'm saying here. But does that make me a bad person? No. Look, let me just show you, because this is real important. Jed. Okay, you've told a lie. Jed, what does it make you? It makes me a person. Okay, you've chosen human, or what do you say, normal. See, we're all very predictable. Well, if you tell normal. one lie, you know what makes you? I'll give you a clue. Are you ready? It's not a sinner. This is specifically the right term. Whatever. So you've told a lie. What are you? Uh, Come on, I'm call it what it is. Have some courage, you convictions. I'm a liar. Have so, you ever stolen something? Of course. So what does that make you? A stealer. A thief. A thief. A stealer. Now Jesus said if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Many, many, many times. Okay, by your own admission, Jed, you're a lying, thieving, adulterate heart, and you're self-righteous because you've said I'm a good person, I'm a nice person, when the truth is you're a liar, a thief, and an adulterate heart. If God judges you by that standard, the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? Um, I'd be guilty, Will but... you go to heaven or hell, according to God's standards? Well, uh, God's standards? Who's to say what God's standards Here it standards is. This are. is God's standards. All liars of their part in the lake of fire. Man, you're in big trouble, Jed. Now, maybe you're saying to yourself, man, I could never walk up to a complete stranger and say, excuse me, you're a lying, thieving, adulterate heart. Neither could I. Neither would I. Just using biblical principles, I've drawn a confession of sin from him. And listen carefully, using that approach with hundreds, perhaps thousands of people on a one-to-one -one basis, I have never, as far as I can remember, seen anyone offended by that approach. Why? Well, what's he going to say? I thought theft was the right thing to do. I thought adultery was the right thing to do. No, the Bible says in Romans 2 verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, the conscience bearing witness. Con is with, science is knowledge. Conscience, with knowledge. When we lie, steal, lust, fornicate, blaspheme, we do it with knowledge that it's wrong. And on the day of judgment, we'll be without excuse. 
So now with this knowledge this man has, he can now see that he is an enemy of God in his mind through wicked works. That he's, as the Bible says, by nature a child of wrath. That the wrath of God abides upon him and that every time he sins, he's storing up wrath that will be revealed in the day of wrath. He can see that he's weighed in the balance of eternal justice and found wanting. He can understand that God is angry to sin, that he's condemned. But now he can understand why Jesus died on the cross to redeem us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. It's as simple as this. We broke God's law and Jesus paid our fine. And all who repent and trust in him receive remission of sins. God says, case dismissed through lack of evidence. All your sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. So someone with this understanding can now therefore exercise repentance towards God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his death and his resurrection, he can receive the gift of everlasting life. He puts his hand to the plow and now he doesn't look back because he's fit for the kingdom. John Wesley, in writing to a young evangelist, said, preach 90% law, 10% grace. You say 90% law, 10% grace, couldn't it be 50-50? Well, think of it like this. I'm a doctor, you're a patient. You have a terminal disease. I have a cure. Now, how am I going to handle telling you? Probably like this. I'd say, come in, sit down. I've got some very serious news for you. You have a terminal disease. I see sweat come to your brow. I think to myself, good, he's seeing the seriousness of the situation. And then I begin bringing out medical books, x-rays, and I, over 10 minutes, convince you this poison is seeping through your system. For 10 whole minutes, I speak of nothing but this terrible disease and its horrific consequence. 10 minutes. How long, therefore, do you think I'm gonna to have to talk about the cure? Not long at all. I say, oh, by the way, there is a cure. You say, give it to me. What's happened is this disease and its terrible consequence, knowledge of this terrible disease and its consequence, has made you desire the cure. And that's the function of God's law. As we look at God's law, we see the terrible disease, we see our danger, it makes us hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, an unregenerate person has as much desire for the word righteousness as a four-year-old boy has for the word bath. There's no desire at all. They don't desire righteousness. The Bible says they drink and it can be like water. They love the darkness. They hate the light. I had no desire for righteousness before I was a Christian until I was confronted with God's law and its demands. God took my rotten, dirty heart that loved to lust, that preferred lying to stealing, I was, and lying to, to telling the truth. I was no different than any other person. I just hid it very well. He took me and he transformed me. He gave me new desires for what was right rather than what's wrong. He opened up the Bible to me. It was like a light coming in God's Word. You need light. That's what you need. If you're, you're blind in your sins, you're dead in your sins, I can't convince you you've got to do it yourself. It's as simple as that. And you don't want to because you love your sins. You're a slave to pornography. You love your premarital sex. You just can't help it. You're a slave. You're like a moth to the flame. God says, if you call out for me, I'll save you from your sins. I'll save you from hell. I'll save you from judgment day. I'll save you from <laughs> I had absolutely no desire for righteousness, absolutely none, until I was confronted with God's law and its holy demands. When I suddenly realized that God requires truth in the inward parts, that he saw the thought light, that he sees the darkness as pure light, that I'd given account of every idle word I'd spoken on the day of judgment, then I began to say, what should I do to be made right? I began to hunger and thirst for righteousness because the law did its part in preparing my heart for grace. Charles Spurgeon said they'll never accept grace until they tremble before a just and holy law. You'll never convince a man to take a cure unless you first convince him of his disease. In Acts 28, the Apostle Paul said he testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. What are we doing when we testify the kingdom of God? We're seeking to persuade people concerning Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. How are we going to convince an unbelieving world that he is the only way they can be forgiven? Well, we do it like Paul did, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. Well, how do we persuade someone concerning Jesus out of the prophets? Well, we point to the prophecies of Matthew 24, Luke 21, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We show sinners that the Bible is axiomatic, it's self-provable. 
You can substantiate that this is a supernatural book simply by looking at the prophecies of Scripture. You can see there's said to be an earthquake increase, famines, diseases, nation would rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, violence would increase, homosexual increase, there would increase in the occult interest, increase in vegetarianism. Scoffers would say, where's the promise of his coming? All things have been the same. But Jesus said, watch for one sign. When Jerusalem is obtained by the Jews, then the end of that time will come soon. And the Jews had no homeland for 2,000 years. In 1967, they obtained Jerusalem, culminating all the words of the prophets. So when a man looks at the prophecies, when he looks at the prophets, he begins to have faith in the word of God. He begins to say, this is a supernatural book. So when we preach out of the prophets, we speak to a man's intellect and create faith in the word of God. A man says, whoa, that's in the Bible? He begins to believe the scriptures. But when we preach out of the law of Moses, we don't speak to his intellect, we speak to his conscience and bring the knowledge of sin. And the Bible says, Paul testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And many Christians do preach out of the prophets. They do use prophecy to convince a man. But if we convince a man merely intellectually that he needs to come to Christ and there's no knowledge of sin and he makes a decision, he's a false convert more than likely because the Bible says, if there's no repentance, she'll perish. If there's no knowledge of sin, there'll be no genuine repentance. God said, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge of the law, Hosea 4, 6. Paul said, without the law, he had not known what sin was. So if we want to see genuine converts, those who are genuinely repentant, we must preach out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. Because Jesus warned that many would come to him on that day and say, Lord, Lord. And he'd say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Thou shalt not kill. Uh, thou shalt not commit fornication. Fornication. Uh, what else? Love thy neighbor. That's three. Uh, how many more you want? Uh, <laughs> thou shalt honor mother and father. That's four. Uh, thou shalt not get on TV <laughs> and, and get asked these questions. Can you name any of the Ten Commandments? Um, not to kill, thou shalt not kill. I know stealing's one of them, right? And then, um, don't, don't covet your neighbor's stuff, like your, like their wife and stuff like that. Let's see. Ten Commandments. I think there's ten of them. Okay, I don't know. Do you know any of the Ten Commandments? And I don't know anymore. Can you name the Ten Commandments? No. And, um, Give me one.
Heineken, Budweiser, Old Style, uh, Red Dog, Bush, Red Wolf, Natural Light, Guinness, Foster's, Beck. Budweiser, Corona, Tres X, Amstel Light, some Poly Girl. One more. I'm gonna look like an alcoholic. Uh, Current Amstel Light, Coors, Coors Light, Miller, Miller Light, Bud, Bud Light, Corona, Heineken, um, Molson. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, that's good. Your name changed. So, I leave the ball in your court. Consider this teaching. Think about it. Be as the Bereans who search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Study the book of Romans and see if what I'm saying is true. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul said, I had not known sin, but by the law. The law stops every mouth and leaves the whole world guilty before God. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Find yourself a sinner an experiment on them. May God bless you and keep you. If you're interested in more information regarding Ray Comfort's ministry, contact Living Waters Publications at Post Office Box 1172, Bellflower, California, 90706, or call 1-800-437-1893, or log on to the website at www.raycomfort.com.